Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good buddy Ty Frank. We're here to talk about movies and genre and all things that you love and things that we love and hang out and be a community together. What are we talking about today? <laughs> what are we talking about today, Ty? Well, uh, it, this is a fan request. The, apparently, the fans have been bugging the shit out of Joseph, and he got tired of it. And the he fans finally, have spoken. He finally right. bugged the shit out of us till we got tired of it. So now we're doing um, The Martian. What if The Martian's Joseph's secret... You know what? He has too much power. Like, what if yeah. The Martian's Joseph's secret favorite movie... And he's like, I want to talk about like, the fucking no, Martian. Like, no and fan so then asked he, for it. Then he so, doesn't. Yeah, nobody asked for it not, at not all. One fan and asked so for then it. He's but like, Joseph's hey, like, hey, all, hey, the fans have been. He's like, wait, all wait, the wait. Patreons want to talk about the Martian, and they, you know, and maybe it's Joseph in that one fan that we all hate. So the power yeah. that I, don't I like have the, is bugging you for two months and finally getting it. Yes. <laughs> so no, I it's have control, no power. It's controlling the list. It's being the mouthpiece for the patrons. Very true. No, no. They. This is. I uh, we've I think we've done three votes and this one has always been at the top of the uh the list. So they will be very happy. And 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 he's using that talent now, or not talent, but uh that power to give himself some on screen time. Like he's like like he's the talent now or something. <laughs> yeah. Do you see him you see him giving himself some on screen time? Yeah. I got credit. I got credit on IMDB, man. I'm you know Yeah, you were the porn be a, star. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Oh, yeah. you got credit for what? What's on IMDb? I don't know. Oh. What's on IMDb, Joseph? Our episodes are on IMDb. Well, holy shit. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like, I think if you win the Oscar for the greatest podcast that has ever existed backwards in time and forwards in time of all time, then you should probably be on IMDb. Don't you think? I think if you, if you pay like $5 a month to get an IMDb Pro account, you can put fucking anything on IMDb. Like like some dude who got coffee for Spielberg on on some movie has put himself on IMDb as a associate producer of but that do you, movie. Do you have IMDb Pro? I do not. What are the benefits of IMDb Pro as opposed to IMDb? Uh, IMDb Pro, you can wa- you can look at more stuff. There's some info that's not available to the public that you can look at. I think you can also add and remove st- or add and and ask for stuff to be removed. I mean, IMDb, IMDb is basically Wikipedia, but for movies. Like, anyone can add stuff. Anyone can edit stuff. It's, it's chaos over there. What are we talking about today, Ty? We'll probably have to add all that said out. We're talking about Joseph. The Martian. Oh, you already said that? Well, I, yeah, I was we're just talking about us The Martian new- and Joseph's excessive power and making us talk about stuff we don't want to talk about. <laughs> I was just saying it because we were going to cut that out, but then I thought there's no fucking way that Joseph will cut anything out that we talk about him. <laughs> There'd be no way. <laughs> no. No, if we bring Joseph up, that always winds up in the episode. When did you first see, uh, well, you know my good pal, I don't know if you know this or not, but my good pal Matt Damon's in this, this movie. Yeah? Are you, are you good buddies with Matt Damon? Uh, well, so my, my, I mean, we, my buddy wrote the book that it's based on. Are we having a buddy off? <laughs> Who's buddy? <laughs> yeah, let's buddy off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess, we, I guess we hung out once. I wouldn't call it a uh, uh, buddy. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but when we were doing season two of The Expanse, I was up in the rafters and they were lowering me down for something and I had the spacesuit on and, and the radio comes in on the spacesuit. And uh, they were in the studio next to us shooting that movie where they're miniature. You know what I'm talking You remember that oh, movie? Yeah, yeah. I remember when they were shooting that. Downsizing. Yeah, yeah. I remember when they were shooting that. So they were shooting downsized in, in the studio right next to us. We shared a wall. And so I was yeah. in the rafters and my radio was on their frequency. So I started hearing a conversation between him and the director, and I just was thinking, like, that voice sounds... F-. Like, I was just thought I was just up in the rafters waiting, and sometimes there's just chatter on the radio, and you're just listening, and it has nothing to do with you, and you're just kind of there listening to it. And so I just figured it was that, and I was kind of tuning it out, but I was like, God, that voice sounds familiar. Is that, is that, the, is that the time when Breck took, put you up in the rafters and then forgot about you? And then you were just hanging up there. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that scene, but okay. it was this, it was the same stage and the same yeah. a part of the same thing, like waiting to be lowered down on cables. And I was like, "Is that fucking Matt Damon?" And then I was like, "What is Matt Damon doing on our set?" And so uh, because they kept giving instructions in there, and so I would be like, "Is that for me?" And Matt Damon would be like, "Is is that for me?" And it like, "What? Wait, what?" 
And then the director's like, who is that? What's going, you know? And so like, we all got tangled up in this, like, who is that? And then the sound guy was like, oh, we're on, we're on this frequency, whatever. Change the frequency. Is that? So I consider that us hanging out. I mean, don't you think so? I think, I think that's, I think that's true. I think you guys shared a special moment. Yeah, so my pals in this, so I already have like a. So, so you a, were hanging from some wires up by the rafters, furiously masturbating, <laughs> listening to Matt Damon. Listen, <laughs> the, I left out the furiously masturbating for a reason, Ty. There's, there's uh, good people that listen to this. <laughs> listen, Bell, I, do not put me in the rafters seriously masturbating. <laughs> Seriously, uh, masturbating I, in I the think, rafters. I think I think that Please. might drive our viewership up if we do that one. <laughs> Maybe there's like a fetish site where that would be something that uh, would be you know be able now, to fund. Yeah, all we have to do is start showing your feet on camera, and uh, we'll be uh, to be able to fund this expensive podcast. To fund the the podcast, we just got to show your feet on camera. Right. All right. So, so the Martian. I think the connection here is is the Expanse was known for being. Relatively near future, grounded sci-fi, and The Martian is about as near future grounded sci-fi as you get, because The Martian feels like it could happen like a year from now, right? I mean, it's really near future. It only uses technology that we currently have. Um, Andy, Andy Weir, who wrote it, um, he's an engineer. He's really into sort of the technical side of of sci-fi, the technical side of space travel. Right. And uh, tries to write books that only use stuff that we actually have or plausibly will have. Were you? Uh, upset? So I think that's the connection. I think that's. I think that's why fans of the Expanse also want us to talk about the Martian. Uh, were you upset because you and Daniel discovered the theory about slingshotting around pl- planets to use the gravity? No, we did to not discover that. Were you upset when Andy Weir put that in his books? <laughs> that is yeah, that is no. your theory, right? That is your thing that you came. I, don't, I mean, I don't even know if it's a theory. Yes, you as, pro- as you proved that, you, as, you as the person who who invented the theory of gravity. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, I was very upset that a whole bunch of other people have been using gravity in their stories since I invented that. Yes, it's like people say me. that uh, Benjamin Franklin invented electricity. Yes, yeah. like, did he inv- did he invent it? Or did no. he discover it? You know? Well, he didn't even discover it. <laughs> yeah. Like, like everybody kind of knew about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of there. Yeah. He was just flying a kite in the windstorm. But anyway, does it make you upset when your theories like that are when you see them over all over the place? Because yes, gravity I'm very, was like. I'm very angry at all of the people who used the theory of gravity. Yeah. Even um, Newton. Yeah. Even Newton. Because yeah. I clearly invented that. Yeah, but that I mean that's an interesting point though that one of the big dramatic things in the story is that these astronauts who are actually on their way home from Mars have to do a, a slingshot maneuver to get back to Mars because they don't have any you know they've used their fuel the fuel is used up and so that's one of the points of sort of realism I guess for the Martian is that you know they they don't have like a yeah, I mean, let's face it, the Epstein Drive in the Expanse is, is fairly magical. Um, we don't have anything like that. They don't have, you know, Andy didn't put anything like that in his book. So the, the ship that the astronauts are on when they discover that the Matt Damon character is still alive, and we can get into the plot in a minute, but the thing they use is something that actually exists, that as- astronauts actually know about. So it's not any kind of magic technology. It's uh, a realistic thing. Now, the, the thing that's not realistic is that any group of astronauts would disobey direct orders from NASA to go get that guy, that pretty much would never happen. If you give the conceit of these guys are going to disobey orders and go back for their guy, this is a realistic way to do it. That's part of one of the problems that I have with the movie. Um, well, actually, let's don't jump ahead. So let's let's yeah. Let's, so let's yeah, let's, yeah. let's talk about the movie itself. So the yeah. so the Martian, written by Andy Weir, uh, he's he's only written a couple of books, but uh, both of them very successful. The recent one. Um, Oh, shit, the name of it just flew out of my head, the one about the moon. You know, he's a, um, you know Andy Weir is a big fan of this podcast, right? Did you know that? I, I did not know that. So, yeah, he's, so, I'm just it, kidding. He's not, he's not a big fan. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be very surprised <laughs> if Andy's spending his time uh, watching podcasts. So it's a 2015 movie based on this book by Andy. And I don't, I don't want to give the impression that Andy and I are like best friends or anything, but yeah, but, he, was just, he was just the best man at your wedding. He, he, uh, yes, he's also, he's also my, my firstborn child. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, so Andy's one of those guys that like, you know, you know, you, I'm sure this is true for you too. So you wind yeah. up with like Comic-Con friends, mm-hmm. like people yeah. you only ever see at Comic-Con. Yeah. One was, and just so I had visiting. a list of people. 
that I, every Comic-Con, I would wind up hanging out with that person and I always enjoyed hanging out with them and we'd have a good time. Mm-hmm. And then you go home from Comic-Con, you go ahead and go back to your regular life and you don't think about it again until the next Comic-Con. You're like, oh yeah, I'll probably run into Andy and we yeah. can hang out again. So Andy was one of my like Comic-Con friends, like for yeah. like four years in a row, mm-hmm. Andy and I would wind up at the same party. We would wind up hanging out and talking about sci-fi stuff for mm-hmm. an hour or two at, at whatever party. Didn't, um, did he, didn't he self-publish The Martian? Joseph, see if you can research that fact. For some reason, that's in my head. Will do. So when news of The Martian came out that they were making it, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I was actually pretty excited. I mean, obviously, it's a book that I admire. Um, and I used to joke with Andy. One, one year at Comic-Con, we, we were kind of joking around. And I told him, hey, you know, the, the Martian is just an Expanse prequel. Right? <laughs> like they're, they're, in the same, they're set in the same universe. Right, right. So... You know, I, it's a book that I admire, um, yeah. and Ridley Scott obviously is a director I admire a great deal. So I was now, pretty excited. Did you excited read the book before you out. knew Andy? Did you read the book before you knew him? I don't remember if I read it before I knew him or not. I mean, I read it right after it came out, but I don't. He was at Comic Con, I believe, right after the book came out, and I think I might have been at that same Comic Con. I'm not sure if that's the first time I met him or not. I don't know, remember exactly the time frame. Guess what, Wes? What you were right in 2011. Uh, his debut novel, uh, the book was originally self-published on oh. his blog. Oh, oh, so he did. So he did a, uh, he did a uh, John Scalzi. That's interesting. Uh, so go. You were in the middle of a story, and I rudely no, interrupted no. you. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I, uh, I'm, I'm just talking about like sort of my connection to the Martian, and a lot of people were talking about the Martian around the same time that they were talking about the early seasons of The Expanse. So it just kind of felt like the, you know, we, we kind of got lumped in together quite a bit. Right. So I can um, see why I can see why the fans are, are um, you know, wanting to talk about it. So since you read the book and I haven't read the book, what was your first in- impression of the movie? And did it live up to what your experience was in the book or the things that you like better? How did it compare? I think it's an incredibly well-made movie. Um, I think Matt Damon is, of course, very charming and Jessica Chastain can do no wrong. Like she can come to my house and take all my stuff if she wants. There are also more sort of like with any book, there's more details in the book mm-hmm. than can be fit into a two hour movie. So mm-hmm. I think they're, I think they're both good experiences. I think if you watch the movie, you're really going to have a good time. It's, it's a fun movie to watch. And I think if you've watched the movie and you're interested in the book, you should read the book. Cause it's got some stuff in it that didn't make it into the movie that I think is really good. So I, I, I think they're both, uh, they're both good experiences. Yeah. And I don't think one precludes the other. You know, I had an acting teacher that would say, as a character, you never feel sorry for yourself. Now, in life, sometimes we feel sorry for ourselves. But as a character, you never feel sorry. Even if the circumstances, even as written as, oh, he sits down and feels sorry for himself. You never do that because nobody, it turns people off and they, they are, they, it takes them out of their story. So if, you, if something happens to you and you're an actor and just pushing for emotion, trying to show, you know, look at me crying, look how emotional I can be, and immediately people don't feel yeah. anything for you because you're doing all the feeling. If you try to restrain that and not show that like we normally do in life, then they will feel for you. So when Matt Damon's like, I'm not going to fucking die on this planet, and he starts doing, you automatically care about him. You automatically yes. are in his... And if he felt sorry for himself for one second, it, it, me personally, just my personal taste, it just would check me out. And if it was like somber, but it was fuck, it's funny. It's yep. some great humor, and he's incredibly charismatic, and is it's one of the best roles that he had at this time for a while. It kind of reminds you, like, oh, this is why Matt Damon's a movie star since probably the Born Identity at this point. And you see this, and it's like he's fucking funny, and you know, great moments, and he and he's an intelligent. Uh, he's intelligent himself, so you believe that he's competent in this thing. And so that's, it, casting him and his performance was one of the things that really made this movie work for me. He gets to do something. So, you know, he did all those Bourne movies. He's not funny in them. He's charismatic because he's Matt Damon, so he's got yeah. natural charisma. Matt but he's, Damon. He's never, he's never, like, being charming in the Bourne movies, right? He's mm-hmm. just being, like, the badass who beats people up and shoots people, right? Mm-hmm. Which is fine. I, I like badasses who beat people up and shoot people. But <laughs> seeing him in The Martian let him do something he hadn't gotten to do in quite a while, mm-hmm. which is just be funny and relaxed and charming. And really, I mean, if you think about it, it's a one-person show. Every scene with Matt Damon, he's by himself. Mm-hmm. So 
It is it is a movie about some astronauts trying to go rescue their friend, and then a second movie, which is a one man show about a guy growing potatoes on Mars. Which I mean, think about that as an actor. Like, have you ever gotten to do anything like that where you are the only person in every scene, where it's kind of a one man show? I've done a movie where I'm in every scene, but not a one man show. There's a lot. Yeah, that's of, what I'm saying. Is I've, is the I've never the done one a movie, man show part of yeah, it. Yeah, no, no, no. Where it was just me, um, yeah. by myself. No. You know the problem solving in this movie is fantastic. Well, let's and, let's talk let's let's do, let's talk about the movie real quick. Okay, so that we can so we can get to that. So yeah. it, it, it spoilers if you haven't seen The Martian, you know we're going to spoil some stuff about it. But The Martian is about an astronaut who is a part of a multi-person mission to Mars. An emergency happens while they're down on the surface. That requires that they immediately lift off their landing craft or it'll be damaged and they'll be trapped. And something happens that leads them to believe that the Matt Damon character has been killed. So they take off, they get back up to their orbiting ship, and you can't go back down again now. Like they're now they're up and they have to go. And Matt Damon was not killed and is able to get back into the habitat, which is still there, which is still functional. And now he is stranded on Mars. So it's Robin Caruso, Robinson Crusoe, right? It's the guy stranded on the desert island, except in this case, the desert island is Mars. And then the rest of the movie is his character solving the problems that he needs to solve to try to stay alive on Mars while hopefully NASA can mount a rescue mission to go get him. And that's the movie. Yeah, somebody <clears throat> described it as Castaway meets Apollo 13. Which I think is a, yeah. is a is a great a great connection and the yeah. and I and I love a shipwreck genre, but the uh, have you ever heard the term competency porn? Yes, and it, it was coined by a guy named John Rogers, whatever. And and I'm a I'm a competency porn guy. I'm uh, a John big Rogers, fan. by the way, is is was one of the first friends I made in Hollywood. I love John Rogers. He's 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 my screenwriting Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, seriously, he's he's. Yeah. If you guys don't know who John Rogers is, he's one of the most insightful guys about Hollywood and movie making and TV making, and has been a successful guy in Hollywood for forty years now. Uh, if you ever get a chance to to watch any of this stuff, do he's he's very interesting. But the term is basically when somebody that is highly competent or highly intelligent that is in these situations, these really difficult problems that they have to overcome, you through their lens are solving the problems with them and yeah. they can describe it or break it down in a way that you understand it. Um, which in reality you don't understand it, but you think you do when you're watching the movie and it makes you feel like you're smart and that you're solving these problems and that you have these abilities, you know, going through and you, you feel like you're understanding some complex science stuff. Yeah. And there's a couple of things in the movie where, um, and, and I think the best versions of competence porn do this. Mm -hmm. Where there's a few things in the movie where he does something, you go, oh yeah, I know about that. I would have thought of that. <laughs> yeah, like most yeah. of the time it's not, but it, and and as long as everyone in the audience has one or two of those moments, mm -hmm. then you feel like you're part of it. Like I yeah. would solve that problem too. I know about that thing, right? And everybody's right. got different skill sets. So what would the thing you would have thought of is different for everybody. But yeah, but as long as you give a few moments where everybody kind of feels like they would have solved the problem too, then you're sucked yeah. in. You're part of the story. Competency porn works best in horror, I think. It's it's like that movie we we did at my house that we talked about, you know, like if somebody is really smart and doing all the right things, it's way more fun even if the the whoever they're fighting is it, Oh, you're talking about your next. Yeah, your next. Yeah, yeah. And uh it it really works well in horror, but for me, in the series of problems that he solves, the potato, growing the potatoes was the only thing I got. And then once he got past that, I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm fucking dead six ways to Tuesday, man. Like, now, now, would you, would you have known to go get the bags of shit and mix it with the dirt? That's, so that's you, the only thing I would have known. That's the, only, <laughs> that's the only thing I would have known in the whole thing is like how to fertilize it and everything like that. But wouldn't, wouldn't that soil be radioactive or do I not know what I'm talking about? Like, does it, doesn't the soil on the, on Mars, does it have radiation or no? No. I mean, there's a lot of radiation coming down from the sky, Uh huh. but it's I, the soil. I don't think is particularly radioactive. Right. Um, Cause there's no, there's no magnetosphere on Mars. So if you go outside, you're kind of got a lot higher amount of radiation coming off of the sun onto you than you do on earth. 
Now, what I read was really one of the only, one of the very few false notes, uh, scientifically speaking, was the storm, the high-powered yeah. storm that knocked him off. So does that mean, does it mean that they have high-powered storms, but because of, it doesn't have the density, so it's the yeah, winds Yeah, so gonna... there, are, there are wind storms on Mars, and they can get fairly high speed. They, they, mm-hmm. They've clocked some pretty fast-moving winds on Mars. My understanding, and I am not a professional Scientist, I am not. I don't work in NASA, so take this all with a grain but of salt. You My did, understanding, but you are famous for the slingshot theory and and inventing gravity. Yes, <laughs> inventing gravity. <laughs> uh, but my understanding is that the atmosphere on Mars is so thin that even when the wind is moving very fast, it doesn't have as like if a hundred mile an hour wind hits you here on Earth, you you get tossed around, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's like those storm winds, like what's hitting the the Gulf right now. Mm-hmm. You know, those high speed winds really knock stuff around on mm-hmm. Mars. They're not going to have the same amount of force because a hundred mile an hour wind on Mars is a hundred times less dense. So it's a it's, it's 1% of the air moving at the same speed. I, I don't think it's going to throw you into the air or anything like that. Uh, two things that didn't work for me in, in, in the setup, you know, while we're here at the setup, whatever is the camaraderie of the crew in the lived in field did not land with me. Mm-hmm. Would would I when I watch this movie, I see actors that have been oh, flown in. They're they're meeting the wardrobe. Okay, you're gonna do would you dress this. Okay, hey, here's Matt. Hey, Matt, how are you? Okay, okay. So look, you guys really like each other. You're gonna come here. You know, da 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 da. We have this, and they come and they okay, and they do it like nothing felt lived in. Nothing felt real. If you watch the opening of Alien, there's not one second you didn't doubt that these guys have spent a lot of time together. And yeah. it's so lived in, and also the just the way they dress, like the, you know, like everybody in the Martian dress differently. But like you, um, the bandana that Yofat Koto wears in the thing, or um, Harry Dean Stanton, the Hawaiian shirt. Like there's just like expressions of their character through their clothes. This is different. I mean, Alien is truckers in space. No, right? I'm it's not merchant marines I, in space. No, it, it is yeah. different. But what what's different is like you're talking about a different maybe education level or social economic level. But what's not different is people are people. People have unique, different um, expressions of who they are through what they do. And I just don't think that it was lived in enough. Like I didn't, I didn't feel the, the relationships that they have, the love they have. I just, it was and in, you know, people say, you know, it was so quick before it gets established. Watch five minutes of alien. And you're like, oh, you know who everybody is strongly. Everybody's on board. You, you gotta, you gotta, as, just by their behavior, you get a sense of backstory of who they are. So that whole chemistry of the cast, it didn't work. And also, it, you know, of course, this is a shipwreck genre. You know, he's probably, it's Matt Damon. He's probably gonna live at the end. But why cast Jessica Chastain? And I know this is 2015, but she was still a star at this time. And as soon as I see Jessica Chastain, I know that she's going to be have a significant part in it. Her contract's too much for it to be. So when they leave, it's like, well, they're going to be coming back. They're going to, like, yeah. as soon as there's a thing, it's like they're going to come back and they're going to save them. I just think, like, if you, you have Matt Damon, it should be people that you don't expect to see again. People that you, you know, that, that are cast. Because then it's like you have no idea how he's going to be saved. You're going to know he's going to be saved. But, you know, as soon as it's Jessica Chastain, you're like, oh, well, she's coming back to save him. You know, they're coming back. Yeah, and, but but I, I will not hear your complaints about that because Jessica <laughs> Chastain as a spaceship captain is pure pornography for me. That's just pornography. Listen, listen I love her and I, and I'm glad she's in it and I enjoyed the movie because she's in it and she's a fantastic actress and, and I enjoyed that. But from a story point of view, it's like, well, I see the whole thing playing out now. And so then it's just the fun of like him solving problems, but it's just not as the suspense isn't there. Is it? I mean, you know, again, I go back to aliens, a different genre, a different thing like that. But you didn't know who the main person was. You know, well, Dallas. No, they, they actually play it. They play with your, with your expectations because Dallas was played by a yeah, fairly well-known that, that, actor. So you expect he's going to be the hero, right? He's yeah, going to win. Yeah, exactly. But, well, I mean, Tom Skerritt wasn't that well-known back then. He was he was, in, he was, he, I think he was the best known of those actors. He was a working actor. He was yeah. a working actor that was known. But you thought he was going to be the lead just by the fact that that's how movies work. Just like, yeah. oh, okay, he's the guy. Yeah, okay, so he's the captain. He's going to be the hero. And then they fucking kill him. So the suspense is so intense. It's so real. And you don't really wrap around the protagonist and who that really is until the movie really starts to get going. 
And yeah. so like it would be and Sigourney interesting. Weaver was kind of an unknown. She was this was her first movie. Yeah. So, you know, so she was nobody certainly. expected her to be the no the hero. Yeah. I think it should have been Matt Damon and some unknown. Some some and, 2015 version of Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like some no 1979 version of Sigourney Weaver. No, but no, but you know what I'm saying. Like the two, yeah. whoever whoever was the unknown in 2015 who right. went on to become a huge star. Yeah, yeah, some 2015, and then Matt Damon die. You know, as right before you, <laughs> you know, right early on, and you're like, wait, holy shit, Damon died. And then when Chastain's doing the loop to loop to come back, that. The, I think they call it the Ty Frank uh, gravity slingshot. Yeah, the, the, when they, yeah, the Frank maneuver. <laughs> the Frank maneuver. Yeah. The Frank Abraham maneuver. When yeah, they do the well Frank, known, well known spatial <laughs> thing. When they yeah. do the Frank, the Frank Abraham, uh, Abraham slingshot, Chastain should fucking die. And then you're like, wait, what? Everybody could die. Then you're gonna have suspense going in, and then this guy's gonna or girl. I don't, or, I don't think this movie is. Built I know. For don't suspense. say. It. I know it's not. Yeah. There has to be some suspense that you don't get the payoff. There has to be Apollo thirteen, the Titanic. You know the ending of those movies. You know what's going to happen, and they still create suspense, right? I didn't know the ending of this movie, and there's zero suspense. I hear what you're saying, but I don't uh, entirely agree because I think early on, when when Matt Damon's cracking jokes and he's He's figuring out how to grow potatoes and all of that stuff. Yeah, that's not very suspenseful. I think later when the, the, the sort of the ticking clock is he's starving to death mm-hmm. and they're wondering if they're going to get there in time. And, mm-hmm. and I, think, I think that for most people watching the film, that did build a sense of suspense that we're watching this guy emaciate on camera. You know? it, and there was a moment, it, it wasn't as powerful, but when he does get rescued, and they pull him in. There was an emotional payoff that it did work. Yeah. But it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't buy the camaraderie. It was something about the casting. It was something about, I didn't get that feeling. Well, they, they, they played into, they, they definitely played into the NASA stereotypes, which uh-huh. are, you know, professionals. They don't, they don't bring a lot of personal stuff into it. You know, I mean, the Apollo 13 guys have said, that the movie Apollo 13 is much more dramatic than the real thing was that they never lost their cool. They never yelled at each other. Mm-hmm. They never got excited or, or whatever. And they never expressed fears. They just kept solving problems until they got home. That's sort of the reality of the NASA astronaut is they're kind yeah. of boring and deliberately boring. They pick people who are boring. They pick people who don't get excited. They pick people who don't lose their cool. And so what the Martian does, it kind of plays into that where all the people on the ship are kind of no, you, know? you but listen, I mean, real genius, all those kids, half of those kids would probably go to NASA. They're, they're all, not astronauts, though. But whatever, smart people. They're all yeah. the, like, genius people. But they all have, I mean, look, we met a lot of people, is it JPL, at, uh, in Pasadena? They're all, like, they all have these really great, you know, they're really smart, but they all have these great characters. They're very distinct. They're very, you know, they have these. And so, what was the guy, the Mohawk, that runs the... Um, What's his name? Uh, oh, Bobak. Bobak. Bobak's yeah. great guy. Like he, you know, Bobak was one of the the guys there. Whatever. Like there's a there's an expression of an individual within well, that. Well, they got, but they do have those guys in the ground, and I I feel like what they did is in the movie they they represented the dichotomy of NASA fairly realistically, and I think I think it's one of those things where you wanted it to be a little more dramatic, and what they did is go more toward realism. So the people on the ground are the weirdos. Yeah. The people up in space are the boring people. And that's kind of how NASA works. You, um, you, get, you get a Bobek on the ground. You never get him in a spaceship. <laughs> I don't think it's about, I, I honestly don't think it's about boring. I don't think, I think it's, it's actors show up. Here's your wardrobe. Uh, oh, you guys like each other, everything. Just go act. Okay. And then it's, it's just not lived in. It's the relationship hasn't, you know, been developed. How would you subvert? So, like, if you think about Scream and how Drew Barrymore kind of subverted yeah. the last girl, you know, where in the beginning it's like, oh, she's going to be the star of the movie. This is going to happen. And when she fucking died in the first sequence of the opening scene. Spoilers. <laughs> spoilers. But you, you <laughs> see that, and that was so exciting because then you're like, oh, all rules are off. The, all the game is off the table or whatever. How do you subvert this? Uh, like, in Castaway at the end, Tom Hanks gets killed by the wave. Like, how do you subvert? And by the way, I feel like 
Anyway, I'm about to jump on the tangent, but how would you subvert this genre? I mean, it would be like Matt Damon and another guy being on Mars and Matt Damon dying at the end. Like, well, he, that, you know. but, that's, but that's a complaint about the source material at that point. Um, because the, the movie is a fairly faithful adaptation of that book, and that's right. not the story Andy was telling. Andy, in, in, Andy wasn't telling a story to subvert your expectations or to subvert tropes. Andy was telling a story about a smart guy pitted against survival on Mars and coming up with solutions to survive. That was the story Andy was. Yes. And, and what we're doing right now is we're just going on. We're just branching off about a movie that yeah, I yeah. liked. I know what, what, what uh, I'm uh, saying is yeah. I, I think that is less a complaint about the movie and more complaint about the source material from my yeah. perspective. Right. Why well, it to me it's not even necessarily it's it's in terms of the movie. It's like this is a movie I liked and the the things that didn't for me operate as well as all the other things in the movie are this, the camaraderie and the the, the relationship of the crew. And uh, an example of how that works and I don't think this I think this is beyond genre. I think I mean you can watch Platoon or you can watch Alien or you watch Aliens you know, that that crew, there's not for one minute when they're on the screen, there's not one second. You're like, oh, these people have been together for a long time. They care about each other. They, they, you know, they razz each other, have a crew and they're, they're, they try to do some razzing, whatever. It just didn't work for me as it normally yeah. does. And, and again, I think, I think they're, I think they're playing for realism. But anyway, the, I'm just saying the chemistry, whatever, it didn't work and I wasn't emotionally involved, but the payoff worked at the end. I mean, particularly when Matt Damon hears the voices uh, when they were slingshotting, doing the, the Frank um, Abraham and coming back to pick Matt Damon up and yeah. he hears their voices for the first time. And you're like, oh, shit, he hasn't heard anybody's voices yeah. for years at this point and hearing the voices of the people that he cares about. And so that was a moment that I believed their relationship through Matt Damon's performance, but that wasn't achieved at, until until that until that moment for me. Yeah, I think as an actor, you are attracted to performances that are more sort of authentic. The 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 emotion and that sort of thing. I think Andy in his book was less interested in that part of it and more interested in how do you send a message back to Earth when you only have this one broke ass camera and Hey, he comes up with using hexadecimal like for mm -hmm. Andy using hexadecimal to send messages because you have limited bandwidth is the thing that I think gets him off. I think that's the thing he finds interesting and exciting. So there is a, there is an element of sort of it's less about the character drama and less about the people than it is about the problem and the solution to it. Yeah, but I think if we're sitting here and we're discussing, like, as a fan, you know, like, yeah. this is what we're doing. We're kind of getting yeah. in the weeds about things that, yeah, of course, all of that stuff, you know, Hexadex, all that stuff, that gets me off, too. Like, I, you know, and I, and I get Hexadex, what he's doing. Hexadex gets Hexadex, you off. Hexi, Hexadexies. <laughs> uh, but that gets me, Hexadecimals, that gets me off, too. And all, the, all that, all the science, I'm going to science the shit out of this, all the stuff yeah. that I didn't understand was fun and compelling and interesting. Yeah. And, I, and I will say, as, as much as I love Jessica, Jessica Chastain, and as I said at the beginning, Jessica Chastain can do no wrong, one of the complaints about her as a performer that I have read from people before is she is a little cold. She can come across a little ice queen. I think that works in this movie. I think, I think if you are the captain of a NASA ship to Mars, you are going to be a list person. You're going to be quiet and calm and you, the person who goes through lists for a living and not excitable. I think that is definitely true, but something being true doesn't make it compelling on screen. Mm -hmm. And I think that that might be the complaint. I mean, true. Are you, but I think that we have seen plenty of characters that have the same dynamic within this role that is captivating, and compelling to watch, you know, Sigourney Weaver and aliens too, and aliens. You know, who is hardened, who is cold, who is emotionally cut off. She is, and, and by the I way. Would, I would not say that at all. It, the, the Sigourney Weaver of Aliens is fury. She is, she is enraged. Mm -hmm. She's angry at everyone. But the, and, the, and that but anger the rage, comes out constantly. But the rage, so that, where does coldness come from? It does come from walling off something that you're trying to control. Something that you want, that you don't want I, but to yeah, express. But, I, but I, and, that's, I, and, and the first act of Alien is that. 
Aliens. Yeah. In uh, Chastain and um, where they're torturing the guy. Oh, oh you're, t- you're talking about Zero Dark Thirty. Zero Dark Thirty. See, she plays that in Zero Dark Thirty, and she's fucking fascinating. You know, it's like, you know, what, what is, you know, the way that she eats her food and the way that she, uh, you know, like the, her, the, the thing that she's up against, the, 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 she's fantastic to watch and it's a very similar character. And so I'm not, I'm saying, you know, like this is what we do. This is what this podcast is about. So you take a movie like this and you talk about what this worked and what this doesn't work. And I just think that Ridley Scott's one of my favorite directors of all time and he's been, and he's made this work a lot. I think that this is the Ridley Scott issue that this chemistry in these crew did not work, which is ironic because he's done it perfectly and beautifully before. And so, you know, knowing the work and the, what goes into making something like this work, and it's not about duration. It's not about how long people on screen, you know, people are like, yeah, but they were only on there for five minutes. Well, that's so the fuck what? That's the work that they need to do to bring a history in. If you walk into a platoon of guys that have been together for five years, you be with them for one second, for 10 seconds, for a minute, and you get, you get a relationship, you get dynamics, you get that kind of comes through. If you walk into a set, when, I, I've walk, you know, when I'm new and you walk into a set and you see the crew that's been working together for a long time, within one minute, you get the camaraderie, you, get the feel, you, you see that these people have been together for a long time. So the chemistry and the camaraderie of the crew did not work and if you think about something like Platoon, they, they actually lived together for a certain amount of time and they created that dynamic. I don't think you have to do that, but there needs to be either the individual actor brings the work to it or the director makes that chemistry happen. I, I, I think it's, it's become very clear to me that what actually is happening here is that you hate Jessica Chastain and you hate NASA. <laughs> you hate astronauts. Uh, and next I time look- I'm hanging out with Mike Massimino, I'm going to tell him <laughs> Wes Chatham hates astronauts and he hates NASA. Listen. I love, I love astronauts, all right? And I love Jessica Chastain. I think she's fantastic. I just praised her in Zero Doc 30. Yeah. I don't think this is the... Uh, I'm just saying within this movie, that was the one thing that was missing for me. And we got... You yeah. know, we spent a lot of time on it. We, got, hey, we can move on, but that was the one thing. Because I love the movie. I think it's fantastic. I think it's funny. I think it's compelling. It, the science is so interesting. And I think that's... you know, uh, I did not read Andy Weir's book, but I think this is something he's really good at. To, it, he it is, yeah. Because the yeah. problem solving is, you know, it, it, it is compelling and it builds upon itself. And it's, you know, so like there's one thing to ha- like have a, a sequence of problems that are, and you watch somebody solve them, but if the problems connect and relate to the story and are constantly slowly, slowly raising the stakes and they're connect, that's really, uh, that's a real craft and it's really well done. Uh, I I agree with that. Um, I think I think that that is the joy of the movie. Is that is watching him solve these problems, stay alive just a little longer, and uh, stay and alive the, no matter what. I'll find you. Sorry. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, last of the Mohicans call back there. <laughs> but but that is. I mean, the, it, Matt Damon says a line at the end of the movie that is the treatise of the movie, which is he says, you just start solving problems. You solve the first problem, then you solve the next problem, and maybe you get to come home. That is the entire movie, is just people solving problems until the character gets to come home. The best stuff in the movie is the Matt Damon stuff, and the second best stuff is the ground, the weirdo ground crew that are trying to figure out how to save him. That is the, the Bobek people right it's the weirdos it's the mohawk guys it's it's the the awkward girl solving all kinds of problems to figure out how to do this those weirdos are are a lot of fun the people on the ship are the least fun part of the movie i will agree with that it's it's cold it's a little there's not a lot to suck you into that story that story feels kind of perfunctory honestly as much as jessica chastain as a spaceship captain is pornography for me right it's still it's a little cold yeah and you just, that's all I was trying to say is what you just said. Now, let me ask you a question. So when he goes and gets the waste, I think it's plutonium, when he gets the nuclear waste out to heat, to heat his compartment, and yeah. how, does, how does that work? How is he using that to heat his compartment? I don't know. And then why didn't he use that plutonium to create a time machine to then go back before he went to Mars. Well, that, but, but see, now, okay, so obviously Andy has to take some liberties with the science. And this right. is one of the areas where the movie breaks down a little bit, that 
obviously, if you have plutonium, you build a time machine <laughs> so that you can go back and and fix the problem. And the fact that he doesn't do that does show that you know Andy was fudging the science. I mean, little. he claims to be a science guy, but yeah. like, I mean, you got fucking plutonium. I mean, you've seen how to make a yeah. flux capacitor, like. And you got the you got a hot rod four by four out there in the uh, in the in the Martian well, maybe, desert. Maybe maybe what it was is that four by four wasn't capable of getting up to eighty eight miles an hour. I think they do talk about exactly how fast that thing can go, and I don't remember. But maybe you're right. Maybe that's the thing they can't that, find. So the, so you don't even bother making a flux capacitor. You know you're not going to be able to get up to eighty eight miles an hour. Maybe that's but, why. But you know I think what, we just solved the problem. But you know what can go eighty eight miles an hour is the the fucking rocket at the end that he shot up to go see them, and that that's a great sequence because he is hauling ass, and it does a really yes. good job of doing that. If you create the flux capacitor and you put it on that rocket, then you go back in time before it all happens, right? And right. so then when they're all scared of the storm, you say to them, "Listen, the air in the in Martian atmosphere is thin." So you guys are panicking. You need to chill the fuck out because it's not going to be a big deal when it happens. You know, we solve right. Do we solve it? I think um, we may have. <laughs> I, 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 th- I think we just made a better movie. <laughs> was, uh, was there any other? So you said there's some sciencey stuff in there where you're like, oh, I, I get that. So you kind of brings yeah. you along for the ride. So yeah. what are some of the other things you're like? Oh, I, I kind of understood that. Oh, can- when he starts burning uh, hydrogen to make water. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, that's totally how you would do that. Yeah, dude, yeah. Burn hydrogen. You're going to get water. So as, as soon as he was like, I need to make water, I was sitting there watching the movie and going, oh, I wonder if they have, I wonder if they have hydrogen. Because if, if they have hydrogen, you could burn it and you could, get, you could get water out of it. And then he goes and he gets the hydrogen and he starts burning it to make, to make water. I, I felt very smart in that moment. Is there any other any moments where you're like, oh, I, I would have got that. I would have known that. Or not even know it, but you understand what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, when, when he starts, I mean, I, I, was, I was a computer nerd back in the early 80s when hexadecimal was still a thing. So when he starts using Are you using not a computer hex, nerd anymore? Uh, I've stopped being a computer nerd because now, <laughs> now I just play on my uh, PlayStation, so I don't, I, don't need to, I don't need to hack a PC to, to make my video games work anymore. I think a, a, a hi, another highlight for me in this movie was when um, Donald Glover, he gives the, uh, the Frank Abraham... Um, demonstration of the slingshot theory. Yeah. And he, he, he brings them around the table. And I thought he was really fun in this, you know, when they come and Donald Glover uh, is great. Incredibly yeah, he, charismatic. He just got a yeah. great sense. Like a, a, his presence has something, a good sense of humor, if that makes sense. Like he's always eating, yeah. you know, by the way, there was a lot of eating in this movie. Like a lot, of, like they did. How many times have you seen this in a movie, right? Um, oh, what's the actress's name? Uh, the one that discovers that the, the picture is moving, that the Martian is moving. When Mackenzie Davis, tell me how many times you've seen this scene. So there is, and I just watched Starman recently, and this, is, this happens a bunch on, in Starman. So uh, Mackenzie Davis is like, oh, I'm in the break room. This is like everyday life for me. I got my coffee. I got this thing. And I sit down, and I'm hitting some things on the computer, and, I, and I'm chewing, and, and she yeah. noticed something. So how many times yeah. you see that in the control thing? And then, like, you know, Damon's eating these things, and he's like, so... You know, we got this going, and then, you know, and then they solve a problem. Yeah. That Donald Glover, because they same thing. He's he he they he wakes up and he's crawling around and he gets his first thing he does is gets his chips and he's like, and then he has his thought, and so there's like there's like it's like come on, really, like have one thought eating interrupting experience. But I really like the scene <laughs> when when Glover's like, um, I'm sorry, who are you again? He's like Willie, the director of NASA. <laughs> Or Teddy, his name was Teddy. Yeah. Teddy, the director of NASA. <laughs> it's like that, he, that he doesn't actually, even know who the fucking director. Is. But that felt very real to me. Yeah, uh, that felt I, great. I loved that that scene. was fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I love that scene because you know the the director of NASA is a political appointee, right? Right. They're 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 generally not the administration. The president's administration appoints a director. So for the for the ground level grunts for the ground level scientists that that that's just some that's some political appointee that that would be like you know like probably most cops don't spend a lot of time wondering who the the attorney general of the United States is right even though technically they work for that person right, right? but usually guys like he maybe he's so like some people that are so brilliant and they're so focused on the math and the science they don't give a fuck about the hierarchy of like who's who or no. the whole thing he's like. No. And no. that's kind of what came across. 
Do you think they did the Lord of the Rings meeting as like a, a, a kind of a, like a little joke for Sean Bean? In the, in the thing. <laughs> I hope they did. Yeah, and then and Kristen Wiig, you know, again, she's like Donald Glover. Like she, she makes me like her presence is funny. Like yeah. there's something about her, and she was a weird cast to me in the beginning because I was like, I can't help but not laugh at her. Like I can't help but like find like how is she being funny? It's like Will Ferrell. It's like when he tries to be serious, I'm like, there's something funny in there. Um, but when she's like, I hate all of you people. This like, oh, that's why you love Kristen Wiig. Yeah. But, you know, I did feel like like Kristen Wiig was a bit of a waste in that part or like Sean Bean. Like what was what, you know, was it, like I feel like they it's, wasted it's, him it's, a little bit in that. Yeah, because there's there's a lot of stories being told here and many of them get very limited screen time. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have you have a few actors who don't have a lot to do in this yeah. movie. And yeah, but the, the nice thing about like a, a Donald Glover or a Kristen Wiig is they make the most of their time. Like they're mm-hmm. only on screen for a few minutes, but they, they use the shit out of those few minutes. They're just great. Right. I- I'm sorry. Who are you? Like, <laughs> we said that to, to Donald Glover. If you were on that spaceship. So you say that, that you don't think the, 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 they would have obeyed orders and they wouldn't have slingshot it around and went to go pick yes. up. There is a reason why most astronauts have a military background. Mm-hmm. Or at least for most of history, most of the space program history, mm-hmm. they've had a military background. Those spacecraft are many, 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 many billions of dollars. And the loss of one is not only a huge financial loss, but also a huge public relations and, and black eye, public relations loss and black eye for, for the United States. Um, astronauts do not get to make their own decisions. They just don't. They follow orders. And th- they're, when they get orders from ground control to do something, they fucking do it. And they are selected part of why they, what they are selected for as astronauts is that they are that kind of person. That's the one fudging that Andy does in the story is he, he posits that there's a group of astronauts who will absolutely disobey the orders of NASA to go back and try to get the guy. Next time I see any of the astronauts that I know, I'm going to ask them if any of them would have done that. I'm going to guarantee you that the answer is no. Yeah. they would be like, well, look, we would want to save our guy. Yeah. We would not want to leave our guy behind, but we cannot risk seven other crew and a hundred billion dollar spaceship to go get one guy. We can't do it. Would they though? I mean, look, here's the thing. I, I, when I was listening to this and I was watching, they were like, look, we can do the Ty Frank Abraham uh, slingshot and we can make it back and we can save them. And I was like, fuck yeah, I'm on board. And so she's telling the thing and she's like, you know, we're going to, um, you know, here's the thing we're going to do this. And I was like, yeah, let's, you should, we'll go get this mother. Yeah, absolutely. And then, but when she said, hold on, we could all die. I'm in it. Let's go. Hold on. You know, there's a chance that this doesn't work and we could, I'm there, go for it. And she's like, all right, but this is another 500 days of the mission. That's like, the record goes off. I've done long tours before and I, that's where she would get me. And I'd be like, wait, wait, how many more days? Look, another year and a half? Um, if you, if you, know you fall off of it, if you <laughs> fall off of an aircraft carrier, they yeah. won't turn around and go get you. And that's, <laughs> and that's something that you're surrounded by air, you're yeah. you're on planet Earth. You can turn a ship around pretty easily. Well, not they, easily, but they, you, it's possible to turn a ship around. They just around. leave you with like a little beeping thing, like with a beep slide or whatever, and they're like, <laughs> I mean, "Hopefully, somebody will come back and get you." you like, know? hopefully, hopefully, one of the destroyers that is following yeah. the aircraft carrier will get you. Yeah. But the aircraft carrier ain't turning around for your ass. No, you're staying I mean, in look, the water. There's that, you know, there's people that have been out in space for a couple of years, I think, at this point, and they're talking about another year and a half. And, you know, some of them hasn't seen their yep. significant others in a year. And a half. I was like, nah, sorry, Damon, you're on your own, buddy. I know we shared that time on the uh, radio, but <laughs> you'll figure it out. <laughs> you had a good run. You know, yeah, you had I'm a going good home. Run. Yeah. <laughs> and, and obviously, without that, the movie doesn't happen. So you have to have that. You have to have the crew deciding to do that. And they, and need, to, and, and they need to be the ones to save him because they were the ones that abandoned them, that abandoned him. And, and yes, emotionally, they need to be the ones to do it. Unless they cast no names, then you don't care. But if it's, if it's a movie star you cast, then they got to have an arc and they got to, they got to, you know, redeem themselves. And all right, do we want to get to our top five or is there anything else you want to say? Well, about so I, I think the segue into the top five is clearly the Martian is a movie that we both admire a great deal and also has some things that we don't think work as well. 
So it's it's sort of this mixed bag. And in a way, that is a microcosm of, for, for you and I, Ridley Scott himself. Yes. Ridley Scott is a mixed bag. Ridley yeah. Scott has made some of the most brilliant movies of all time, hands down, top five list of all time, no argument. Right. And he's also made some stuff when I'm watching it, I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. How did this happen? What is happening right now? And, and because of that, I think the Martian is just that in a small version, right? right. It's there's some, there's some brilliant stuff in there, and there's also some stuff there. You're like, what, what, why do we do that? So what we talked about was doing a. Well, hold on. What, what what are some of the? Is there anything else that we didn't cover that that kind of bumped you about the movie that that we didn't cover? Because it sounds no, I, to no, me, it, I mean, it seems to me all the stuff that Andy Weir uh, is really into and really good at, the movie served that well. Yes, yes. And it was story stuff that. What could that wasn't as done as effective as it could have been, you know? If you yeah. got Sean Bean in a movie, maybe he, maybe Sean Bean did have some something else to do, but you know, it got cut out. Yeah, and and, and I think that so my my favorite description of Ridley Scott, um, and it, it was a, a friend of mine. I, I've stolen it. I've been using it ever since. But a friend of mine, you know, he's a big many fan years of podcast, by the way. So Ridley, just ahead of time, just so you yeah. know, you, you like we, we're we, just gonna we we, we, we have love great respect you. for you. We love you. Yeah, But, so a friend of mine many years ago said to me, he said, you know, the thing with Ridley Scott is, if you give Ridley Scott a great script, he makes a beautiful, great movie. If you give him a terrible script, he makes a beautiful, terrible movie. <laughs> so the thing that is always true of Ridley Scott is his filmmaking sensibility is always on point. He has one of the most amazing eyes mm -hmm. for a frame, an eye for the camera, an eye for what should be there I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And and he can capture mood with a camera in a way that very few other directors can. Mm -hmm. I don't think story is his focus. Mm -hmm. I think he focuses on the look and the mood and and the frame and, and like he's he's a shooter, right? Mm -hmm. I think story he's less interested in that. That's just my perception, and maybe that's not true. But but that's watching his movies. I just get that sense, and so. He, there's a bunch of movies that he's made where they're beautifully shot. They're beautifully directed because he's never incompetent. He's never a bad director ever. It's not even possible for him, but there's stuff that stuff that he's made. I'm like, why, why was this the project he picked? Why is he making this movie? I don't understand what it is that attracted him about this story. So that is the dichotomy of Ridley Scott for me. It's always beautiful. It's always mm -hmm. worth watching once because you're going to see some amazing shots. You're going to see some amazing scenery on your on your screen but afterwards you might be like what the fuck what what yeah, was he I doing mean, there what why, it's like, why that movie it's like an alien before you see one character how he goes through the ship and they get the distress signal and it's reflected yeah. off of the shield the face shield that's on yeah. the thing and the music and the way that it goes through you're you already feel the movie you you're yeah. involved you learn so much just by seeing the atmosphere this really worn down lived in greasy yeah. spaceship and um so he's a brilliant guy and i think the only reason we would do a list like this is because he's one of our favorite directors yes um and and he has a gigantic list of movies he has made a t he's worked a lot so you can't do a top five and bottom five james cameron james cameron's only made like six movies and they're all right? masterpieces I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and you you can't do that. You could do this for somebody like you know like uh, Steven Spielberg. Or, it, you you need a lot of movies in the catalog to do a list like this. A top five and a bottom five. And really, Scott has a lot of movies. And for me, he is a director that while I always appreciate, I am sometimes baffled by the choices he makes. So we're gonna do the top bottom. Yeah, Ridley Scott. Um, do you want to stop with start with the bottom so we can end up on top? I think so. I think that's a good idea. I, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go on, I've said this before and I'll go on record with it again. I hate the alien prequels. I hate them. Prometheus, Alien Covenant. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm with you on this alien prequel thing. I, and, and they're, and they're beautiful. They're, they're, they're beautifully filmed. And the, and the production design is awesome. And I should love those movies. I should love them. And I watch them and I just hate every minute of them. I, I don't know what it is about those movies I hate so much, but I just hate them. Can I ask you a question? And I wonder yes. this about myself. Do you think that your, like, your love for Alien 
of being one of your favorite movies of all time has influenced of course it has how intensely now let of so course imagine has. if if prometheus came out and you an alien didn't exist and the movie there was a movie came out i would prometheus. think it was a dun- i would think i would if it came out i'd be like oh that was a beautifully shot movie it was really stupid but it was it was beautifully shot yeah yeah but the fact it was it was the same director and the fact that you put this expectation and these hopes yes. and you see it and it's like ah oh, how could you go from yeah i hate with a burning passion 1492 I hate that movie. That would be probably my least favorite Ridley Scott movie of all time. The Gerard Depardieu, yeah. Christopher Columbus movie. Yeah. I hate that movie. I think, <laughs> I, think it, I, I think it is a dumb movie, and I think it's a dumb movie that attempts to turn a, create a hero out of a fucking mass murderer and slaver. In, Christopher Columbus is a piece of shit, and that movie tries to make him the hero of the story. And, and make it like he's trying to help the native people when he was fucking enslaving them yeah. to dig up gold for him. Yeah. Fuck Christopher Columbus and fuck that movie. Like, I, you know, my greatest sin when it comes to movies is, is boredom. If you yeah. bore me. And it's, bo- and it's boring. And it's fucking boring. It's boring. It's stupid. It's unjust and it's boring. Yeah. Um, I, I, Joseph put the counselor. I agree. I think the counselor is a mess. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't understand what he was trying to accomplish with that movie. It is just a mess of a story. I also agree with Joseph on uh, Exodus. I think Exodus is a mess. And, and the thing is, we've had good Exodus movies. We've had movies. You know, the, the, the movies about Moses and, uh, and about the Exodus and stuff that were, you know, Charlton Heston, man. Yeah. We've had good movies in that genre. Come Why to are me, we no more, a- Moses. But if you do, <laughs> you shall surely die. <laughs> yes. Right. yes yeah i mean we've had good movies why why are we making a bad one yeah um i don't know do you do you have i i've picked all the ones so you're, far you're, do you have you're one speaking that, my lane i mean this is you do you have one that you particularly like i didn't enjoy robin hood but i don't think it's one of his yeah worst i would I, 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 I didn't i wouldn't even put a good year up there i think there's plenty of other um yeah but uh, um worse ones up there i don't have the list in front of me but all the ones that you said, I agree with you, and and I share the hatred of fourteen ninety two. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's terrible. Uh, it's just and a I terrible, tried. Terrible I movie. thought I was going to like it. Uh, and and he's got some lesser known movies that I actually think are fairly charming. I think Matchstick Man is charming. I, I you know even though it's not as well known. You know what? I, I I didn't. I don't hate this movie, but I I don't know why it exists. It it, it doesn't feel like anything to me, and it it kind of bores Which me. And it was on the it was on the HBO rotation. Is White Squall. Yeah, White Squall. Yeah. White Squall is just kind of boring. And it had Jeff Bridges, so you every time yeah. it's on, you it fools you of like, oh, Jeff Bridges and this, and you watch it, and you're like, I don't, I don't know what this is about. I don't. It doesn't. Yeah. It didn't move me it, or whatever. It, it's, it's not. It's not great. It's yeah. not great. I I agree with that one. Now, top five. Top five is tough because he's got a lot of great stuff. I mean, oh my God. clearly for me, Alien is the greatest sci-fi horror film horror ever made. Ever made. Dude. And I and that is and that's and that's saying something because the thing is in that category too, yeah. And the thing is one of the greatest movies ever made. Yeah. And Alien is still better than that. It's crazy how, I mean, he has probably three, two or three at least on my all time favorite movies of all time. So Ridley Scott yeah. is one of my favorite directors. Alien, yeah. Blade Runner, and uh, Gladiator is up there for me. Yeah, uh, Gladiator. I agree. Gladiator is a. There was there was this period. A few years after it came out where it got cool to hate on Gladiator. I never understood that. I think Gladiator is a fantastic movie. I fucking it is, love where did when did that happen? That it got cool to hate oh, on. Oh, just that they're, they're like like movie critics like there I think there was some anger that it won the Oscar and so there was like these movie critics who were who were trashing on it. But yeah, Alien, Blade Runner, Gladiator, um I like Black Hawk Down, but I don't think it's top five for me. I think it's a good movie, but it's, it's, I really like black Hawk down and it's a good movie. I'm not bashing. And I love Thelma and Louise. Um, I think Thelma and Louise is one of his top five for sure. Yeah. I would put that in his top five. I love that movie. And I know you're a huge fan of GI Jane. I I do like GI Jane. I know saying that as a joke. Oh, I I wasn't making a joke. I know uh, we've talked about GI Jane before. I, we, we had that conversation. I really liked him. And I, I, I like GI Jane too, 
mostly because of the amazing performance by um, uh, Aragorn. Fuck, his name just flew out of my head. I was just about to say it, and then it flew out of my head too. Vigo, Vigo, yeah, Vigo Mortensen. Vigo Mortensen. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I think Vigo Mortensen as the Command Master Chief in GI Jane is uh-huh. a power performance. I think he's amazing. Yeah. Demi Moore is great too in it. She is. Um, De- Demi Moore is great, but I think I think the movie he, he transcends the movie. He yeah. transcends the movie. Yeah. yeah, she's she's as good as she needs to be to play yeah. that character in that movie. He is. Yeah, he's better than he needs to be to be in that movie. Dude, the five year old in me wants to put Legend up there, but I don't know if the uh, if the uh, if, if the story. I, think, I still up. think Legend is one of the most beautiful movies Ridley Scott ever made. Should we put it up there just for the, our five year old selves? Yes, but the, yeah. That now I wasn't five years old. I was like a, a teenager. Black as night. Black as. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's our top five: Alien, Blade Runner, uh, Gladiator, Thelma, Louise, and Legend. Oh, okay. So, so apparently the patrons did a top five survival films. Uh, they did The Martian, Apollo 13, Castaway, The Revenant, and Enemy Mine. I mean, that's a good list. Apollo 13 is one of the greatest men against nature films ever made. I love all of those movies except Castaway. Castaway did not do it for me. Is it because you hate Tom Hanks? No. It's, he's, in, you know, he's, he's incredibly likable. It's the one movie that I didn't think he was that likable. I, you know, I don't, I don't, Castaway, and I, I did have, you know, I actually wrote it out down here, like why I didn't like it and why this, why Martian works so much better than Castaway, but I don't want to go through it all. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, what, were you a Castaway fan? Did you, did it resonate with you? I only saw it once. I enjoyed it. The, the one time I watched it, I enjoyed it while I was watching it. I've never felt the desire to rewatch it. So maybe yeah. I didn't like it that much. Okay. Um, I will, I will say another, another honorable mention for me just because their performances in it are so powerful, is American Gangster. Oh, actually, I would have put that on the top five. I yeah, love I mean, I, I, thinking about it, I, I might put American Gangster as number five ahead of, of yeah. Legend of Black Hawk Down because the, the performance, you know, Denzel Washington and it's Russell Crowe, and, and just the whole movie is filled with astonishingly good performances. It, yeah. An Josh early Brolin. Idris Elba. You know, Idris Elba, before everybody knew who Idris Elba was, is in American Gangster. Yeah. Yeah, this, Josh Brolin is the dirty cop. Josh Brolin is great in that. He tells how, this great how, story. How does Josh Brolin... So Josh Brolin is, is any age. Like, every movie <laughs> yeah. Josh Brolin is in, he's a different age somehow. <laughs> yeah. And it goes forward and back. Like, Josh Brolin in American Gangster looks like he's, like, 48 years old. He's been drinking nonstop every yeah. day for 48 years. Right. And he's just a mess. And then you yeah. watch the movies that came out after that, and he looks 20 years younger. How does yeah. he do that? Well, so he can shapeshift age, but there's people like um, Gene Hackman, who's been 48 for 100 years. Yes. Gene, ha- <laughs> Gene Hackman has always been 48 years Gene old. Gene Hackman was 48 in 1978, and he's 48 today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How like, is he that? doesn't look yeah. different than him in Chinatown. Or a, a yes. French Connection. He looks like French the connection. same actor. Yeah. yeah, he looks like the same actor in, in the French Connection than he does right now. All right, well, thank you guys for hanging out. We love you. Please like and subscribe and ring that little bell. Give us some support. Sophia and needs if, it. And if you're listening right now, Ridley, we love you too, man. We, we have some criticisms of some of your work, but that's out of love. It's out of love, man. Ridley, we know you're a huge fan of the podcast, and I hope yeah. that this doesn't disparage that in any way. You're our favorite director and, and yep. one of our favorite directors. And so like, you know, us talking about this is, is a, is a sign of honor. And, uh, and we, you know, just stay with us, stay with the podcast. <laughs> Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.